Coming to you from the Hudson Media Group studio, this is Talking Politics. And I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, Top 50 Latino, Vida Latino Spirit Online Magazine, certainly the weapon of mass disruption in Garden State Media, and without a doubt, the people's choice and the people's voice. Yes, it's me, Fernando Uribe. Happy May to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it's a, a pleasure to, to uh, at least come to you from wherever you're tuning in here on any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet. And of course, uh, cannot thank the Hudson Media Group enough for their continued support of Talking Politics every single week here. Without a doubt, folks, there is a lot to discuss, so let's get started. Here's what I'm thinking about right now. And without a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, I've talked about it incessantly on this program, as well as my other programs on my award-winning media brand. And one thing that I'm very proud of is basically being sort of the unofficial watchdog of calling out bad journalism in the state of New Jersey. Now, one of the things that I think we've all come to become really accustomed to is the reality that when it comes to whining about race or gender or virtue signaling or being a social justice clown, a woke fool, a pronoun hysteric, a climate hysteric, whatever, folks, all right, we, we can expect those individuals to occupy positions and be employed by new sites like NJ.com, The Star Ledger, Insider NJ, NorthJersey.com, but the one news site that I would not expect that from is, again, NJ Spotlight News. Now, let me just sort of preface this by saying that NJ Spotlight News is looked upon as one of the more preeminent news sites in the state of New Jersey. It's not the preeminent news site because we all know that it's the New Jersey Globe, which is owned and run by David Wallstein. But when it comes to, you know, NJ Spotlight News, again, all I can say is that, you know, we've come to expect them to be much more responsible than a lot of the other aforementioned, you know, news sites that, that I just listed. And again, when it comes to virtue signaling, as I said before, and, you know, whining and crying about race and gender and reproductive rights and, you know, how bad, you know, it is for lesbians in New Jersey, whatever, you know, we can rely on the usual suspects, right? Like Jay Lasseter, Alan Steinberg, Bob Henley, Max Pizarro, Tom Moran, Charles Stile, Okay, and all the rest of the, again, the rest of the Lollipop Guild that co is comprised of, obviously, the group I just listed. But when I think about NJ Spotlight News, I think about more responsible reporting, at least for the most part. Right now, let me preface this by saying that I watch NJ Spotlight News on a regular basis. They have a lot of good stories. Obviously, looking at Brianna Vanozzi is, I mean, listen, she's one hot little mama. So believe me, if you like watching the news at night, especially NJ Spotlight News, you want to tune in for Brianna because she's really nice to look at. I mean, considerably an upgrade than having to look at David Cruz on a regular basis. But once in a while, Uncle Dave will publish a story or do an interview that really, I think, is well done. But then he'll revert back to his usual left-leaning, virtue-signaling ways, which, again, in New Jersey, there's no shortage of them, right? Again, whether it's Terrence McDonald with the New Jersey Monitor, whether it's Matt, Matt Friedman with the, the political New Jersey uh, playbook, or, again, all the others that I just listed. But I expect David Cruz to not fall, sort of fall into this trap of, hey, one thing is talking about what's going on at Rutgers University, right? Faculty contracts. Students maybe, you know, not getting the best learning experience right now because faculty have been on strike for many, many weeks. I get all that. Making sure that adjuncts, part-time faculty, and other administrators within the university itself, the state university, my alma mater, as a matter of fact, that everyone's getting compensated accordingly and rightfully. But to go to Seton Hall University and talk about the fact that an Africana Studies program is not being funded, I hate to break it to you folks, that's not the biggest news in the world. And it really isn't something that I think should really be on our radar. Now, let me preface this by saying, because I'm sure that people like David Cruz, who, who have accused me of dog whistling repeatedly, that's not the case here. I would have the same position if it was Hispanic studies, Caribbean studies, Latino studies, women's studies, gender studies, and all these other sort of humanity-based you know, majors that we see on our colleges and our university campuses. But really what stood out for me, obviously, was uh, late last week, that a group of students at Seattle University walked out in protest um, at the school's South Orange campus, which is, by the way, very nice. I, I, I used to teach at Seattle University part-time uh, while in grad school, and obviously it's a, it's a really great campus, great resources. Uh, some department chairs I don't really care for at that university, but all in all, a great, great college, right? But what they said was a lack of support for Seattle's 
Africana Studies program. Now, the program's only full-time professor and program director left the university last year and hasn't been replaced. Now, the 53-year-old program was ahead of its time in 1970 when it first began, but has over the years been shifted to backburner status, according to Ingrid Hill of the People's Organization for Progress, another left-leaning organization, which we all know, that lives to bitch and bitches to live about anything about race, gender, or anything else, all right? who coincidentally was also a former student at Seton Hall University and also a 30-year employee at the university as well. She wanted to say, quote, it's an ongoing battle at Seton Hall in terms of really accepting Africa studies. That's just not true. And Ingrid, again, is being blatantly disingenuous because we know that over the years, Seton Hall has funded that program accordingly. She also wanted to say, our classes are being held by adjunct professors or part-time professors, and therefore the material is watered down. So we don't feel comfortable in our degrees. Again, actually, that quote is from Amina Kuskat, who's a freshman at Seton Hall University. Students also complained about what they said were heavy-handed policies meant to intimidate students and discourage the very discourse universities are supposed to protect. Now, again, if you go on in J-Spotlight News and watch the segment, you know, pretty interesting as David Cruz attempted to interview uh, various participants during that protest on the campus. But, see, this is where Dave is going wrong here. You see, where Dave... I think misses the bigger picture is that, yes, while Africana studies is important to certain students and Africana studies, you know, obviously is something that some students want to pursue, it's not the end all be all. And I think, folks, this is what bothers me, I think, about a lot of these humanity based majors. Now, again, as someone who works in the social sciences, as someone who has worked in academia, who teaches in academia, I know firsthand okay, about the premise when it comes to at least, you know what, let's pick majors that help students get jobs. I say it all the time when I've been asked as a faculty member at the colleges that I've taught at to participate on career day, on college day, maybe instant acceptance day, okay, where I've been there and students have come up to me and said, hey, Dr. Uribe, what major should I pursue? Because I like this, this, and that. And I tell them all the time consistently, pick a major, that's going to help you get a job. Now, if you're going to, for example, go into education, go into communications, go into nonprofit work, maybe go into political work, maybe go into social work, I have no issues whatsoever with you telling me that you're going to major in some social science degrees or get a degree in the humanities. That's fine, and that's all well and good. But for a lot of kids today in this sort of ultra-competitive job market, what do I hear all the time? Well, I want to get a job that helps me make money upon graduation. Here's a newsflash. And this is something David Cruz should tell you, but he won't because he'd rather acquiesce to these groups on campus, again, with their bleeding heart causes. All right? Students that are looking to make money are not going to pursue these, should not pursue these degrees, basically, because it's not going to give them a good starting salary. Those are, the, those are just the facts. And I'm not just saying that because it's Africana studies. I would say it's about women's studies which is probably one of the bigger waste of time and money when it comes to any degree you can get in higher education, okay, or a multitude of other social science degrees. Again, if you're going to go into those specific professions I just listed, that's all, that's great. I applaud you. I did it myself. But if I want to work on Wall Street, if I want to work in a financial sector, I'm not going to major in any of those programs because I know it's not going to, A, make me an attractive candidate in the hiring process, and B, the starting salary probably is something that is way above my pay grade because I'm not qualified for that, for that position, okay? And that, that seems to sort of be the problem in higher learning today, where let's be honest, folks, we're sort of indoctrinating our kids, whether it's at the elementary school level, middle school level, high school level, and obviously it goes onward when they go to college, okay? But what bothers me, I think, the most is the fact that we need to call this out, all right, if you want to learn about Africana studies, women's studies, Caribbean studies, Hispanic studies, Asian studies, whatever studies, right, that along ethnic and cultural lines, folks, do me a favor. And trust me when I tell you, you can go to your local Barnes and Nobles. And I know there aren't that many left. Obviously, after COVID, a lot of these bookstores closed down, unfortunately, which, you know, I think we all can agree. We love going to Barnes and Nobles, having a cup of coffee, all right, which is overpriced sometimes, and sitting there, whether it's reading in the magazine stand or getting a book or two and sitting there and reading. It's enjoyable. You could spend a weekend at your local Barnes & Nobles, folks, whether it's in Paramus, whether it's in Clifton, whether it's in other various locations throughout the state of New Jersey, 
You can learn about Africana studies. You can learn about women's studies. You can learn about gender studies. You can learn about Hispanic studies, Caribbean studies, Latino studies. You don't have to waste tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars, to get a four-year degree in any of the aforementioned majors when you know it's not going to help you get a job. Okay? It's a waste of time and money. I always tell my students, and I'll tell you right now at home, for anyone that is attending college, whether you're 18 years old or you're at a community college in your 20s, 30s, even 40s, get a major, pick a specific interest in an area, a subject area that's going to help you get a job. The cost of living is going up. Everything's going up. We're living in a country where inflation is still a problem. Food, our food bills are, are continue to increase. Gas prices and fuel prices are still on the rise, okay, in this disaster of an administration in Washington. Okay, get yourself a job that's going to help you pay the bills. That's going to help you in some cases, you're going to raise a family, help you raise a family at least somewhat comfortably. You want to, you want to major in some of these things? That's great. Do it on your own time. Go to a bookstore, learn about it online. There's plenty of free online courses, folks, that you can take to learn about all this. But the idea that seeing all university is shortchanging students is an outright BS lie. Okay. I've taught there, I know that Seton Hall, even though it's one of the more expensive private universities, not just in New Jersey, but anywhere in the country, it still provides exceptional education. It still provides exceptional academics and resources to its students. God forbid they're not funding Africana studies, oh well, what can I tell you? They're not funding Caribbean studies tomorrow, oh well, what can I tell you? If they're especially not funding women's studies, oh well, what can I tell you? Again, ladies and gentlemen, let's have our eye on the bigger picture. Okay, as kids in Japan and in China, in elementary school, learn about calculus, we seem to think that learning about pronouns is more important than getting our kids ready for the real world. That, again, seems to be a common problem in, in our educational system. But by the time they get to college, they sort of feel entitled to major in some BS majors that are, are not going to get them jobs. I expect more of, Uncle, again, out of Uncle Dave. I expect this sort of virtue signaling nonsense from Matt Friedman, from Charles Stile, from Alan Steinberg, from Jay Lasser, from Max Pizarro, from Tom Moran. I don't expect that from NJ Spotlight News, and especially David Cruz. Well, again, listen, let's be honest, folks. He's as left-leaning as it comes to. He loves to virtue signal, but every now and then a story like this, this shouldn't be front-page news. It really shouldn't. It shouldn't be front-page news. It shouldn't be back-page news. It's just really one of the casualties that exist in higher education. And unfortunately, NJ Spotlight News is coddling these kids and enabling them by giving them a voice and a spotlight on a story that, quite frankly, isn't a story to begin with. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. And now some local stories for your consideration. A special thank you to John Hines, the editor of the, of the Hudson County View, for his report on this story. Let's go to the Mile Square City of Hoboken, where Reverend Alexander Santora, a pastor at the Church of Our Lady of Grace in Hoboken tweeted last week that while it was sad that Jordan Neely was choked to death, he was, quote, out of line, which he's right. Neely's stands was threatening on the subway, already punched, injured two senior citizens, and, war and there's a warrant out for his arrest. Again, this is what the pastor wrote last week on Twitter. This is not racial. It's protecting innocent riders when no police are present. He restrained them. Sad that he died. Neely was out of line. Adams is right. Now, Jordan Neely, who was age 30 at the time of his death, was homeless, was also having a mental episode while on the F train in Lower Manhattan around 2.30 in the afternoon last Monday before a former Marine identified today as Daniel Penny placed him in a rear naked chokehold for nearly 15 minutes. Now, the incident was partially captured on video since, folks, let's be honest, everyone has a smartphone today, so it's kind of hard to ride the subway, be at a light rail stop, be out on Burgerline Avenue, Central Avenue, Broadway in Bayonne, wherever, without someone being able to film something, all right? Um, and at, it, obviously it's made national headlines where New York City Mayor Eric Adams has said an investigation is underway and saying that Neely uh, being murdered was, you know, obviously saying that, he, you know, that Mer Neely was murdered was inappropriate at this time because the investigation is not concluded. The uh, incompetent mayor went on to say, quote, I've been extremely clear that the district attorney and the police department, which he's handcuffing all the time by not having more police patrols in subways, but more on that later, they're doing their investigations and I'm going to respect that. There are many layers to this. Let the process follow its course. Now, his remarks came after the Puerto Rican princess, right, U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a Democrat out of the 14th Congressional District in New York, tweeted that Neely had been, quote, murdered and that it was, quote, disgusting his attacker has not been charged. 
And just a few hours after the Puerto Rican princess spoke out about the situation, the New York City medical examiner determined that Neely's death was a homicide via a compression of the neck with the chokehold that was uh, aforementioned there. Now, a rear naked choke is a submission maneuver that was made popular in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and has become a common finish in MMA fighting. Now, the hole can render someone unconscious in less than 10 seconds if applied properly by squeezing on both carotid arteries with the forearms while applying pressure from behind. Again, the carotid arteries, once the blood flow stops there, it's, you know, lights out. Now, applying the choke for minutes at a time can lead to death since it cuts off the airflow to the brain. Penny has still not been charged with a crime as of this recent report. Now, Neely was a former Michael Jackson impersonator, which, folks, by the way, that in itself should just tell you there's something wrong with this guy and why he hasn't gotten mental help and why we're not talking about the fact that the city of New York has let this guy down for years, I think, is something that really doesn't get talked about. Now, he had an extensive arrest record, used to live in Bayonne, and, for example, was just 14 years old when his mother was murdered and, and, and had her body left inside a suitcase on the Henry Hudson Parkway. Uh, his father just recently told the New York Daily News on Wednesday last week that Jordan was deeply traumatized by his mother's killing. Now, again, folks, um, you know, I, I feel bad about what happened to Jordan Neely. Uh, certainly, you don't want to meet your end in that fashion, um, losing consciousness and, uh, and subsequently, obviously, losing oxygen and subsequently dying. But I think what goes underreported here, and listen, folks, whether it's the Puerto Rican princess, AOC, or those on the left, whether it's the virtue signaling liberal media here in New Jersey or nationally, I get it. You always want to make it about race, right? Didn't we learn already three summers ago in 2020 when we glorified a career criminal like George Floyd? And I get what happened to him was tragic. Folks, this is a guy who held a gun to a pregnant woman's head during a home invasion. Forgive me if I'm not going to cry any tears of sympathy for a career criminal like George Floyd, all right? And it certainly is, I think, very, very apparent when it comes to talking about, you know, Jordan Neely, he was also a career criminal, all right, who had, I believe, I think, look at the numbers here, over 40 arrests. The system let him down. The city of New York let him down, all right? Shout out to, again, uh, to Daniel Penny, who I, I believe there is a legal fund out there, maybe not through GoFundMe, because we all know how liberal-leaning GoFundMe can be, but there are websites where you can don donate to Daniel Penny's Legal Defense Fund, which, by the way, I urge you to do so, okay? This is a guy who repeatedly, and again, there's plenty of video out there, okay, making transphobic comments, making homophobic comments that have been captured on video when he's harassing passengers, people on the street. Folks, it just gets to a, a moment when one passenger is at the wrong place at the wrong time, sees someone acting out like this in a threatening manner to senior citizens, to children, to women riding the subways. And let's not say anything of the fact that the black version of Bill de Blasio, which is what Eric Adams is, he's the black Bill de Blasio, folks. That's all he is. He's been handcuffing police. Instead of having more police presence on our subways, on our platforms, on our light rails, wherever, in very congested areas of New York City, right, to make people feel safer because that's what the mayor should be doing, right? No, we keep these to handcuff, right, the police department in the city of New York. And, of course, we have a radically left, out-of-control district attorney in Daniel Bragg who obviously is more concerned about, you know, trying to prosecute a former president of the United States than making sure that the streets of New York City are safer, making sure that he doesn't downgrade 40 plus felonies into misdemeanors because, hey, we don't want to push the narrative of incarceration. Folks, New York City is a disaster. And this incident, I think, is a perfect microcosm of when residents are fear for their lives, someone's going to take action into their own hands. And that's what happened here. Okay? Yeah, it's unfortunate what happened to Neely, but a career criminal like this, hey, one less on the street, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'm really not. And kudos and cheers to that Marine protecting women, children, and seniors that ride the subway, that have no choice but to ride the subway, that maybe can't ride the bus, that maybe can't take an Uber or a Lyft to their place of employment, that maybe just can't walk somewhere. They have to take the subway. And guess what? When you're not feeling safe on the subways, people are going to take matters into their own hands. That's what happened here. Now, it remains to be seen what, you know, the former Marine is going to be facing in terms of criminal charges. But as far as I'm concerned... Hey, folks, Mr. Penny, he's a hero to me, 
and he's a hero to many. Now, again, many on the left, whether it be in the liberal media or all these sort of social justice warriors or all these activists that are now disrupting traffic, that are trying to get social media views and clicks and likes for all those videos, for protesting and, you know, blocking traffic, whatever other nonsense that these people live on. Yes, I'm sure they'll continue to make it about race because it's always about race. All right. Never mind the fact, again, that what many on the left are doing is enabling and defending a career criminal. Yeah, it's unfortunate what happened, but folks, one less career criminal on the street isn't a bad thing. And I'm pr I'll proudly say that, and I'll plant the flag, and I'll die on the hill on that one. We'll see what happens to Mr. Penny, but again, if you can donate to his legal defense fund, I strongly urge you to do so. Now let's move to Jersey City, and a very interesting story, and a thank you to Joshua Rosario with the Jersey Journal for his reporting here, where the numbers are indeed stunning. 104 suspensions were issued to Snyder High School students in recent months, which brings the whopping total in the district to 739 students. But this isn't a problem that's really isolated to one school. Jersey City School District officials have acknowledged, and what school officials and student behavioral experts are calling for is really that it's become an educationally tragic combination of COVID-fueled family financial struggles, a reacclimation sort of issues that they're having to getting back into the, into the classrooms, and the frustration over learning losses that led to an even more startling 485 in school and out of and out of school suspensions over a 31 day period. Again, you can thank the governor, the Emperor Phil Murphy, along with Randy Weingarten, along with the NJEA, for delaying the reopening of schools as long as they did. Folks, the amount of learning loss that kids have, have suffered during the two and a half plus years that schools were unnecessarily closed in New Jersey, I think these are the chickens coming home to roost. Okay, you're not seeing these numbers in Florida, in Texas, and red states, all right, where those governors handled the impact of the Chinese virus a lot differently than blue states did. Whether it was Andrew Cuomo at the time when he was governor, you know, while he was busy maybe, you know, fondling women, you know, he found some time to maybe govern once in a while, okay? Obviously, we know about the ineptitude of the emperor, Phil Murphy, when it comes to his COVID responses and other blue governors. Look at California, for example, with Gavin Newsom. All right, when it comes to learning losses and everything else, folks, let me tell you, I mean, we're just sort of scraping the surface here about the sort of infinite harm that these policies made. And we're seeing it here, for example, in, Jer in the Jersey School District. So, for example, NJCU special education professor Carlo Flores, uh, Carol Flores, excuse me, spoke to the Jersey Journal and said, quote, kids are really crying out for help. They aren't socializing in the way we did. I think there are stressors on society that weren't as stressful as before. Now they're certainly worse. Now, Flores, who has taught special education for over 20 years, said kids have been home and alone and, quote, now we're expecting that they should be also well socialized. Well, they've missed out on a few years. There were 202 suspensions in September, and the numbers have steadily climbed since the start of the school year. For example... Some 229 of the suspensions district-wide in March of 2023, 65 were in school, and 164 were out of school, were issued for disruptive behavior. Fighting is the next largest cause of suspensions with a total of 164, 73 in-school suspensions, and 91 out-of-school suspensions. So, for example, uh, disruptive behavior weekend list includes disorderly behavior in the cafeteria, lighting matches or lighters, disrespect to personnel, loitering while absent from classes, disrupting classes or creating a disturbance, written or oral obscenities, smoking, and excessive cutting of classes, according to what officials were doing in terms of compiling data. Now, District Superintendent Norma Fernandez said the increase in suspension shows the students are still reeling from the effects of the pandemic. Again, folks, thank Phil Murphy for that. For all of you that voted for him for re-election in 2021, you get, listen, you get what you pay for. OK, elections have consequences. All right. We all saw the undue harm that the emperor did to our learning, to our kids in our public schools throughout the state of New Jersey. And yet the NJEA and the AFT have the audacity to now walk back their statement and attempt to rewrite history. I think it's disgusting. I think the NJEA should be ashamed of itself. I think the AFT, led by a despicable clown of a woman, Randy Weingarten, should also be ashamed of herself for attempting to you know, sort of rewrite history. Same thing for Carlos Spiller, the president of the NGA, 
coincidentally the mayor of Montclair, how that isn't a conflict of interest. Again, someone has yet to explain that to me. But again, these forces, these teachers unions worked closely hand in hand with the emperor and they caused your children's learning losses. It's nobody else. It's not Republicans. It's not conservatives. It's not, you know, anti-vaxxers or people like me who are unvaccinated and people like me who consistently will tell you, hey, I'm glad I didn't get, you know, a shot or a booster or 20 other boosters. Okay. Blame state officials. Blame the emperor in Trenton for what he did to cause the learning losses for your children. And we're seeing it here in Jersey City. We're seeing it here in terms of what they're doing to cause irreparable harm to our kids. And they've been doing it. I mean, just look at these numbers, folks. So, for example, in response, the district in Jersey City has opened four mental health clinics in the high schools and established what's called Project Resilience, a multi-tier trauma support system that provides mental health services to students. Folks, that's an amazing, amazing course of action by the city of Jersey City. And again, we'll see where it takes us in the sense of where students need to improve and quite frankly, trying to recover, as I said before, from the irreparable harm that the NJEA committed to them, that the AFT committed to them, and most importantly, the emperor, Governor Phil Murphy, for keeping our kids locked at home a lot longer than they should have when the data told you they should be back in school sooner. Again, you don't see this in Florida. You don't see it in Texas. You don't see it in Georgia. You don't see it in the Carolinas. I hate to politicize a virus, but folks, blue governors took the Chinese virus and used it for their political gain. And now your kids are suffering for it. And so is their learning. And that's our show for this week. Once again, I want to thank the Hudson Media Group for their belief in this program. Obviously, shout out to CEO and executive producer Pat Amelia and the outstanding staff working here that produce this show, that work with me and are very patient with me. Again, God bless them all. And I certainly enjoy working with them. But folks, on this Mother's Day weekend, as it's fastly approaching, I want to take this opportunity to send a shout out to all the moms out there, the moms that have made a difference in our lives, whether it was my grandmother who lived over the over the age of 100, to my mother now and my aunt, to my best friend who's a mother, to my other best friend who's a mother, to all the moms out there. Every day is Mother's Day. You're the backbone of our families. I know in my family especially, my mother and my aunt are the backbones of our family. They're tough, they're resilient, they're witty, they're funny, but don't get it twisted, folks. They're the toughest ladies you'll ever meet. And that's what our moms represent, right? It's that, it's that woman that will never stop loving you. And especially as a man, I think that we can all appreciate that one woman that will never stop loving us. And that's our mother. And again, I'm eternally grateful to her. And I'm so spoiled to have the mom that I have and the aunt that I have. And even for a long period of my adult life, my grandmother as well. But to all of you out there, to all the ladies out there, happy Mother's Day. Hey, everything you do for us on a daily basis doesn't go unnoticed. So God bless you all. And once again, folks, enjoy Mother's Day weekend with all of your families. Don't forget to check out all the outstanding programming, folks, brought to you by the Hudson Media Group. You can check out their websites by going to www.hmgtvshows.com as well as livestream.com slash hmgtv. Don't forget to follow the Hudson Media Group on Instagram and Twitter, like them on Facebook, and of course, subscribe to their channel on YouTube as well. Don't forget to like Talking Politics with Fernando Uribe on Facebook, and of course, follow it on Instagram. In addition to my own Instagram and Twitter personally, it's at the Fernando Zone. Folks, check out new episodes of Blog Talk Radio's Talk on the Hudson, the seven-time award-winning podcast that I bring you on a regular basis by going to blogtalkradio.com slash talk on the Hudson. New episodes will air later this May and throughout the summer. Folks, always remember, if it's unbiased, unfiltered, and unafraid, it's always Talking Politics right here with the Hudson Media Group. I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, Top 50 Latino via Latino Spirit Online Magazine, the weapon of mass disruption in Garden State Media, and of course, the people's choice and the people's voice. Yes, it's me, Fernando Uribe, saying so long, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Mother's Day, and as always, thank you so much for watching.